folks. It's uh, great to be with you. And a lot of you probably wonder uh, why a medical oncologist at Cornell would be speaking to you about sound healing. And it's very important that we understand the difference between Western uh, ways of looking at the human being and Eastern ways of looking at the human being. So the Western way is the way that I was trained and it's very important to look at all the molecular biology, the molecular genetics, the physiology, all those things very useful for helping determine everything from what type of chemotherapy and other medicines a patient needs to what nutritional modalities they'll benefit from. But the Eastern way is to look at the human being as energy and consciousness. And um, that is really the art of medicine. So there's the science of medicine, which is necessary, but there's also the art of medicine. And that's more understanding uh, with the heart. And that's one of the big things that I begin teaching patients even on their first visit because I can't begin to tell you the vast number of people over the last 25 years that have told me in retrospect that having had cancer was the single best thing that ever happened to them. Now clearly <coughs> virtually nobody feels that way when they're first diagnosed or when they're first beginning treatment. So what kind of transformation happens uh, to a patient to let them say that? And it's all that they begin to learn not just to think with their intellect, but also to think and see and understand with their heart. And the Hippocratic Oath that every doctor takes when they graduate from medical school, the third line says, I will keep pure and holy both my life and my art. And so when Hippocrates is referring to holy, he's referring to wholeness. So it's about understanding not just the body, not just the mind, but also the spirit, the essence, the core. And I've never found anything more powerful than music and sound for being able to create peace in somebody's life. And one of the most empowering things I see day in and day out is that regardless of what somebody is going through, they can still have inner peace. And so sound is really like a vehicle. It's a way to take you to inner silence. Now, a lot of people mistakenly think that silence is the absence of sound, but there's really no such thing for human beings as the absence of sound, because even when you're in a completely quiet room, there's still sounds you'll hear, even internal sounds. And so it's not the absence of sounds, it's rather more like an empty uh, cup, an empty bowl uh, that's able to hold your core your essence. And the reason people have so much difficulty trying to find inner peace is because the mind is constantly active. And so the thoughts are continually going. And so it's very difficult for people to reach a meditative state using the mind. Because the mind is the nature just to keep thinking. And so it's not possible to use the mind to have inner peace. And for that, you have to have an experience of the heart. And so different sounds, different chants, those are vehicles to take people, at least vibrationally speaking, to their heart. So I do a lot of medical charity work, uh, and a lot of it started in southern India uh, helping to build and fund uh, this hospital which is called Sri Narayani Hospital and Research Center 
and it serves mainly tribal peoples in southern India. And it is like a classic uh, multi-specialty hospital that is both allopathic and also Ayurvedic. So all the physicians there, they're trained uh, in both, and if they're not trained in both, at least there are physicians trained in both dealing with all the patients. So everywhere you're going in that hospital, you're hearing different sounds, chanting, nature sounds. And I've incorporated the same type of thing in my office. And so when people uh, walk into the office, what I've actually done is I'll have in every room coming from above, it's wired, is chants from around the world. And very beautiful Gregorian chants, Tibetan Buddhist chants, Sanskrit chants, Hebrew prayers. It's all different chanting from around the world. And coming from the ground, I have nature sounds that are recordings of different streams and rivers throughout the world. So the nature sounds very subtle coming from the ground. And then more uh, the chanting is what people tend to notice. So it's just setting a type of vibration the second people walk in. Now, chanting uh, is important for several reasons. One, the breathing. So if you think of what, when we tone or we chant, if it's just even syllables like OM, it's a form of audible breath. So pranayama is the yoga practice. Prana is the life energy that comes in through the breath. Yama is control. So it's control of the breath. And so there are certain chantings uh, that actually will time your breath perfectly to bring you to a state of uh, inner peace. And so I'll work with patients every time they come in. So if somebody's coming in for their chemotherapy and then they're getting uh, their exam, after that it'll be two, three, four minutes of uh, some chanting uh, with different uh, yoga breathing. I also teach people different uh, hand positions which are very powerful. They're called mudras. And all that works seamlessly with the best that you could have in modern academic uh, medical oncology. So the breathing is always happening and most people are breathing in a very shallow manner. When people are in fear or people are stressed or people are depressed, the breathing even becomes more shallow. It's very difficult to be stressed or nervous when you're doing deep breathing. And so this is thousands of years old breathing techniques that literally make it impossible to be anxious or in a place of fear. So that's very, very empowering for people. All of a sudden, they can sleep, whereas they couldn't. If they have to go in the hospital, some fear that was, you know, just pushed into their unconscious, to have a way, instead of just keeping that going, like a tidal wave of fear, of starting to do some pranayama. And so that's extremely empowering for patients to give them simple tools like that that they could do anywhere. Now, when we talk about the human being as being energy and consciousness, when you think, well, human beings aren't really energy, you can't really define consciousness, but we know from quantum physics that, in fact, all matter is, in fact, energy. And all energy has a vibration. And so even if you look at the root of the word disease, dis-ease, it's a form of disharmony. And somatics uh, was described by a Swiss physician and natural scientist named Hans Jenny. And 
he did amazing studies in looking at the role of different sounds on different natural substances. And what he found was is that when you put certain things on uh, plates uh, and other things that conduct vibration, you get the exact same patterns, the exact same geometric patterns that you see throughout life. And if you think that the human body is 70% water, it's an excellent conductive medium for sound and vibration, it's no surprise that what you see in something just like cornstarch and water with just nothing other than sound forming these geometric shapes that you see in seashells, that you see in pine cones, that you see in a lot of different flowers like dahlias, uh, that there is this amazing geometric shape that takes place. And a lot of it is using the golden ratio, for those of you that know uh, about that mathematics. So you see it throughout music, you see it throughout nature, um, and you see it uh, in healing. And it's even said that a lot of these ratios, these geometric ratios, that anything that a human finds beautiful, whether it's music, whether it's architecture, whether it's even the face, it's all ratios that correspond uh, to this ratio. Now, this is a slide that shows some geometric shapes that are created when water uh, with uh, color in it is being vibrated on a steel plate. And I'll give you a demonstration later of quartz crystal bowls and show you, even if you fill those with water, you see these exact same shapes. And this is what's happening in the human being. So somebody uh, might tell you, wow, this sound, it's making me feel very peaceful. But you're unaware that all these types of things are happening uh, on a molecular level throughout your body when you're exposed to those types of sounds. Now, the Sri Chakra is a series of triangles uh, that starts at the very center uh, with five triangles pointing down, four pointing up, and goes out from there. It is one of the holiest symbols uh, in uh, the Vedas. And it was said for thousands and thousands of years that this was the geometric manifestation of the sound Om, which is taught in yoga to be the seed sound for all creation. And it wasn't until thousands of years later uh, that colored sand was put on a plate, a microphone was put underneath the plate, and the sound OM was chanted just repetitively. And the exact Sri Chakra formed from the colored sand. So one of the things that this is an illustration of is the fact that as human beings we're largely conscious only of appearances. So our eyes can only see the appearance of things. It's, they're not good at seeing the depth. They're not good for seeing the entire truth in something. And that's why <coughs> you see people not uncommonly so filled with judgments, so filled with guilt, they'll think, oh, how could this happen to me? How could this happen to my child? Without entertaining any possibility of something good coming from it. Because all they're able to see is the appearance. But there is such a depth beneath that. And again, that can only be seen and understood with the heart. This is just a photo uh, from a ceremony in India where they build the same Sri Chakra out of candles. Now, the Claudney plates uh, were amazing vibrating plates that 
were invented by uh, the scientist who was called the father of acoustics. And so when you put different colored sand uh, on a steel plate and put sound into it, you again will see all these different types of uh, geometric shapes depending on the sound, depending on the music. And Lauterwasser uh, subsequently uh, did excellent photographs of uh, water. He actually did a book called uh, Sound Images uh, and in that he looked at everything from pure sounds with different mantras, different seed sounds, to classical music and overtone chanting and it's amazing. This is just one of uh, many uh, pictures by him of the vibration of water uh, with different music and sounds. You see similar thing in quartz crystal bowls, in Tibetan uh, metal singing bowls. Uh, they even have fountain bowls that the sound uh, will bring uh, up things. So again, it's important to remember what does this have to do with healing? It has everything because the human body is 70% water. Now, that gets us to the difference between the words cure and healing. A lot of people use them synonymously, but they're not. Cure is about solving a physical problem on a physical level. So that is what most people are looking for when they go to the doctor with anything, strep throat, kidney stone, cancer. They're looking to have something set right on a physical level, which is all well and good, but healing is a much broader term. Healing encompasses the wholeness of the human being. And it can be a real doorway to a soul's evolution. And adversity can lead you on a path that you may otherwise never have gone on. So if everything's just going perfect in a person's life, they think, you know, they're going to work, they're getting their paycheck, they're doing their two weeks of vacation every year. So they're not necessarily wanting to learn about meditation or yoga or sound therapy. You know, the need's not there. But when somebody wakes up with a cough one day and they go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got a tumor in your lung, then all of a sudden the need for those kinds of things is there. And that's why a lot of these quote adversities are actually huge uh, openings to a person if they can see it. And that's why it's so important that healthcare practitioners be able to have a much broader context that involves healing uh, rather uh, than um, just curing uh, or setting something right on a physical level. And again, it gets back to the wholeness of the Hippocratic Oath, keeping pure and holy both the life and the art of the healthcare practitioner. Now, integrative oncology involves everything uh, that academic medical oncology would at any institution. So when a patient comes in, uh, I'll do a complete physical uh, history, look at all the scans, the MRIs, CAT scans, pathology, uh, review all the treatment recommendations, whole nutritional consultation, and then review with people about what stresses they're under, what fears they're having, uh, and then how to use guided imagery, meditation, music therapy, sound therapy in their life. And also talk with them uh, about acupuncture, about a number of other healing modalities that are very, very important. And it is something that really starts to create a healing partnership because nobody is leaving that first visit without knowing 
dozens of things they can do to start healing themselves. And it's a very different paradigm than just thinking, okay, what's Dr. Gaynor going to just do for me? It's making them a partner in it. And we know that stress is critically uh, damaging to health. Uh, studies have shown it increases the risk profoundly of sudden death. Uh, we know that even with uh, stress on a large level, like after 9-11, uh, it can lower testosterone and elevate insulin, uh, and that can increase the risk of cancer, uh, heart attack, uh, delayed wound healing, that has to do uh, partly with the immune system. Uh, also, wounds take about 40% longer uh, to heal. Again, we know from many studies that the very parts of the immune system that are responsible for preventing a recurrence of cancer are uh, lowered depending on how stressed or depressed a patient is. So psychoneuroimmunology is the study of how stress affects every aspect of our immune system. There was a study several years ago published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute looking at women recovering from breast cancer surgery. And they found women with the most depression had the most profound suppression of the parts of their immune system that are responsible for preventing a recurrence of the breast cancer. So the old assumption were that emotions were just uh, related uh, to the brain. And since we know that the heart generates the largest electromagnetic field in the body, which is 60 times greater in amplitude than brain waves, which you measure on an EEG. Now that's why you can put electrodes for your heart, you know, around your wrists, your ankles, and get a good reading of heart rhythms. But you can't do that with the brain. The electrodes have to be very, very uh, proximal uh, to the brain in order to see anything. We also know that the magnetic component of the human heart uh, has a field that's 5,000 times stronger than that produced by the brain. So the new assumption is that emotions are a product of the brain and the heart and the whole body acting in concert. And many uh, experiments have shown that there are millions of neurologic connections between the human heart and the human brain. And they go to all centers of the brain, not just those which are controlling heart rate and breathing, but even uh, the parts that uh, are connected with high thought patterns. And there is something actually called heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is the beat-to-beat -beat variation in your heart rate. So it's different than heart rate itself. So very easy to take your pulse, determine your heart rate. But with more sensitive measurements, uh, you can measure what the variability in the heart rate is. When you're very stressed, when you're in fear, when you're sad, you've got a huge heart rate variability. So your heart rhythm's just changing. Uh, and that is associated with corresponding patterns in your brain. The brain will then release certain neurotransmitters that will cause your entire body to react with a stress response. Your GI tract, your adrenal glands, your immune system, everything. Also, uh, what has been found is that when you're at a very low heart rate variability, meaning your heart rate is staying beat to beat, relatively narrow range, you're said to be in a state of coherence. And that will put you in alpha, theta, and delta waves, which are the most relaxed brainwave patterns. That gives you the experience of inner peace. But it's all starting with the heart. And so these 
are very, very important uh, things just because it gives you something that you can measure. And HeartMath, as many of you know, has great devices where if you're interested in you know, working with your patients or your clients so they can see the effect of sound therapy, music therapy, it's a very, very uh, good verification that what they're doing uh, is working. And one of the most important things in working with people is to have them understand the difference between pain and suffering. Again, a lot of people think they're synonymous. So everybody has a body. So everybody at various points in their life will have the experience of pain. But suffering is quite different. Suffering is when judgment starts. Suffering is when the thoughts come that life's not supposed to be this way. And suffering is related to that kind of resistance about what's happening. So instead of having the premise things are what they are, the premise becomes things should not be this way. Things are all wrong. And from that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when people are able to see their own power and how uh, their perception is creating whether they're having suffering or not, again, that's another very hugely empowering thing. And sound meditations are a very, very good way of taking people to a vibration where they can start thinking like that. Because you can't just tell somebody, you know, this is your perspective. You have to be able to take them vibrationally to a place to where they come up with that on their own. So one of the most amazing examples of uh, sound healing is every patient that comes in, uh, I already mentioned, I'll give a session with sound therapy uh, using various chanting. But I have a device in my office that was invented by the chief engineer at Pioneer Stereo in Japan, uh, who eventually left to start his own company. And he created a device that filters low frequency sound from music or from chanting. It's like a, a transducer in the form of a beanbag device. And you put it at different energy centers on the body. So the patient can listen to music or chanting or guided meditation and then feel it when the practitioner is moving it at the different places on their body. So you're literally hearing the chanting or music, but your body is also hearing it. So you hear with your ears, you also hear with all the cells in your body. And that meditation for a first visit will usually go for about 35 minutes. And invariably, the first visit to a medical oncologist is the most stressful day of any person's life. People have to find out about their prognosis. They have to find out the side effects of the chemotherapies. They have to ask questions uh, about their family, uh, what's going to happen over the next six months. So a very, very uh, stressful day. But after this session, people will open their eyes and say something like, Dr. Gaynor, that's the most relaxed I've ever been in my life. So on the most stressful day of their life, they're able to have the experience of being the most relaxed and peaceful they've ever been in their life. So that gives you a sense of how powerful this is. And also, when people are getting chemotherapy, it is very, very different. So I'll have fountains. Uh, in most of the rooms in my office. So just the sound of water, uh, just the sound of the chanting. Aromatherapy is another form of harmony. So I'll always have aroma stones which just get a little bit warm with either jasmine or sandalwood. 
So it doesn't smell like what people associate with alcohol and things like that with a clinic or a doctor's office. And these are all things uh, that really without a lot of effort or cost, you can create uh, a healing space. And uh, the majority of my patients will create a sacred space like that, even in their own home. It doesn't have to be a big area. It could be a tiny little corner of the bedroom. So cancer is an epidemic at this point. One in three Americans are going to hear the words at some point in their life, you have cancer. Uh, it's expected over the next couple of decades it's going to be one in two. So we're talking about almost 50% uh, of the population. And given the number of cancer survivors uh, and the, given the fact that people are living so much longer, it's more important now than ever to be giving people tools during their therapy that they can have for the rest of their lives. So it's important right when a person's diagnosed, it's even more important to give people things down the line that they can share with their families. Uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, looked at survivorship care in this country uh, and the conclusion was is that it was the most neglected phase of cancer care and there are very few guidelines on how to follow up cancer patients other than with scans and things like that as far as the emotional support as far as the psychosocial support it is horribly lacking and one of the reasons is there's just a lack of training of physicians and oncology nurses in that aspect of care. So in my practice, we're really focused on not just the treatment, but also uh, the healing aspect, uh, looking at what can be done to ameliorate the side effects of the therapy uh, and then developing a comprehensive plan uh, that's going to take people not only through their therapy but for decades beyond that. So we know that stress is related to cancer. Now a lot of people will say did stress cause my cancer and the answer is there's not a single cause for somebody's cancer. So, you know, there could have been uh, a major stressor in their life in the last several uh, years before they were diagnosed. Can that have played a role? Of course. But cancer can take literally decades to develop. So it can be distant stress. It can be environmental toxins. It can be genetic predispositions. It could be a hundred other things that we don't even know about yet. But one of the differences between integrative oncology and just pure traditional oncology is to try and identify as many of the underlying causes or contributors as possible and deal with those as well as the manifestation of the disease we uh, call cancer. So prostate cancer uh, has been uh, looked at and uh, we know that the more advanced disease, the more distress uh, this was published by North House in 2007, and it also affected other members of the family uh, equally. So meditation, I have free meditation groups for my patients uh, regularly in my office, and I'll review uh, with them techniques depending on what's going on in their life. Yoga instruction, very, very important, and I refer uh, to a number of practitioners and teachers. Relaxation techniques, again I mentioned how they can incorporate that in their life every day. Guided imagery, I regularly take people through guided meditations. Uh, biofeedback, uh, I like the heart math uh, system the best for that. Uh, and even hypnosis uh, can be useful, but once, you know, hypnosis is really putting people in a different vibrational state. Once you're doing that, uh, it's very easy to take on 
positive suggestions. Studies on uh, meditation and stress. Uh, there was a uh, meta-analysis published by Grossman in 2004 that looked at a uh, number of studies and uh, the conclusion was as people that were meditating regularly had uh, improvements in depression, uh, anxiety, and a number of other quality of life parameters. In cancer patients, meta-analysis has been done found that mood, uh, stress, uh, also sleep, uh, all uh, were better the more patients dealing with cancer were meditating. Yoga has been done. Uh, there was a 2004 paper that looked at uh, Tibetan yoga uh, and people were doing it uh, regularly that had lymphoma and that were getting chemotherapy. Uh, they had better sleep quality, longer sleep duration, and less reliance on sleeping medication. Other studies uh, have looked at people who were emotionally distressed uh, doing a twice a week yoga class. Again, uh, a lot of the stress-related symptoms like fatigue uh, and depression uh, were markedly improved. So guided imagery is something else that's very, very useful and an uh, integral part of sound healing. So again, it can be very difficult. A lot of people, when I even mention the word guided imagery, they'll say, I can't do that. I, you know, can't. Uh, imagine things. But that's true when they're in their usual state of consciousness. Again, once you take people into a deeper state using sound, it's very, very easy for them uh, to do guided imagery. And I've made several CDs uh, for patients and uh, it really uh, makes all the world, world of difference in people undergoing chemo. A number of other medical procedures have to be done when somebody is uh, going through cancer. Uh, endoscopy is one of them. Uh, they've studied music in endoscopy patients. Uh, there's improved anxiety, significant reduction in the need uh, for sedation medication. It's been looked at with fractures uh, that playing uh, music. Uh, they have lower heart rates. Uh, Surgical patients, uh, music was compared with Valium preoperatively, and they found it was equal efficacy uh, for anxiety, and by other measurements like checking serum cortisol, uh, it was uh, equal in efficacy. Also, even live guitar singing during chemo, uh, profound uh, improvement in a variety of different psychological parameters. There were a number of other studies. I'll just mention three here. Uh, music uh, alleviates anxiety in patients undergoing radiation therapy. In pediatric oncology patients, uh, definitely reduces anxiety and mood disorders. And even in hospice care, uh, all the quality of life uh, indicators were improved uh, with music therapy. So, some of the things that are happening that we know, we know cortisol is reduced, heart rate, blood pressure reduced, there's an increase in alpha, theta, and delta waves in the brain, and we also know that you can give uh, a drug called naloxone, which will block some of the positive neurotransmitters in the brain, and people all of a sudden will lose the ability to enjoy music and enjoy sound. So it's having an effect even on the neurotransmitters in the brain. Now, sound therapy is a bit more inclusive than just music therapy. So sound is looking at a much more cross-cultural uh, type of vibration than just thinking on what people consider to be pleasant music. Both are good, but when you're talking about sound, it's going back uh, to a lot of spiritual traditions, using even certain uh, seed sounds like om and other syllables 
that allows a patient to uh, chant along with you or using a crystal bowl or a Tibetan bowl and it changes the breathing instantly and so somebody may not uh, be able to learn to sing but anybody can learn to tone and I'll give you some uh, examples of that. So these are some uh, photos uh, from Dr. Emoto. Uh, many of you know his work. He uh, studied water crystals as they froze. And this uh, first photo shows a very dysmorphic crystal. All water crystals, even though they're different, they'll all form hexagons. And uh, this is a very dysmorphic crystal up front uh, from a dam that had a lot of pollution. And uh, after uh, some uh, chanting, uh, and the same thing happens with even uh, certain positive words, uh, the crystals uh, become like normal water crystals. Again, you think same thing happening throughout your body. Me. <coughs> you said that was a dam. That's water, I think. Just water like, from a dam in water Japan. From a, water from a dam. That's a like reservoir. Nothing to do with the human body, but the no. sound produce that effect correct correct and all it was is freezing it and doing x-ray crystallography of the water crystals right as they froze he's got like three books uh, this is doesn't do it justice uh, with thousands of photos like that Oh, yeah, uh, but not with x-ray crystallography, not like those type of photos, but uh, other measurements looking at cortisol, uh, looking at interleukin levels, looking at natural killer cell activity, looking at natural killer cell number, all those things. With music stimulation yes. of different types? All different types. And would the response to the body be related to somebody's preference that's yeah that's a hundred percent that's what's been found if a person uh, would say I find that pleasant you might not find it pleasant Correct. somebody else might Correct. that's enough to uh, that show that those physiologic changes yeah it just has to be the person finds person it pleasant to, and they will respond yeah to but see the thing is a lot of people don't know there's so many things out there uh, people are unaware of so you know, even a quartz crystal bowl, some people may just find it the most relaxing sound. You'll find somebody else that it grates on them. There's well, all sure different. We hear it, so maybe we'll save the questions to I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so when we're talking about understanding with the heart, I'm talking more about the spiritual heart, the soul. And that's been described as the intelligent non-physical part of a person and you know when we talk about that in medicine people will say well that's not really uh, provable and my answer to that is you know just when you're talking about something being sweet you know you can't draw sweet if you're eating chocolate you know if you're smelling uh, jasmine or something you know, you can't uh, quantitate how much it smells like that. When you're experiencing love, you know, where is it? And so, you know, when you're talking, this is the first uh, baby uh, who was born after we uh, built this hospital uh, in southern India. So it's more an experience when you're talking uh, about those kind of things it is, as it is for a lot of sound healing. Now, Tibetan uh, singing bowls are made of between seven and nine different metals. The first one uh, that I ever heard was given to me in the early 90s by a Tibetan monk who also happened to be a patient. And I was really struck at the time uh, about how it sounded just like dozens of church bells. Uh, that was the experience I had when he brought it to my office. And each of the metals in there are vibrating with a different frequency. And so it's almost uh, an alchemy of how they make those, what metals they put in, 
Sometimes there's crystals and other stones in there. Uh, but they've been associated al also with demonstrable induction of alpha, theta, and delta waves. And we already talk talked about voice and breath. So the voice is nothing more than audible breath. But when you chant with either Tibetan metal singing bowls, you create what's known as entrainment. And you can also do this with quartz crystal singing bowls. Now, it's said that the first ones of these were found in the Egyptian pyramids. They were called uh, crystal carillons, which have been exhibited at a lot of museums throughout the world. And uh, it was estimated that it would take 40 years just to carve one of those out of a solid piece of quartz. They can be tuned to any note, and a number of other things can be added, which will change the quality of the sound. And hearing is the first sense to develop. So the fetus will develop hearing at four and a half months uh, gestational age. And it's been shown uh, in uh, coma patients and people in vegetative states that it's the last sense of all to go uh, neurologically. So entrainment was described by a 17th century physicist named Hudgens. And what he did it was study pendulums. And what he found is that if you put several pendulums in a room in close proximity and you start them swinging, that the larger pendulum will entrain the smaller pendulums and they'll all start uh, swinging in harmony. Now, you will see entrainment throughout nature. Uh, so for those of you that have been snorkeling or scuba diving, you see sometimes on reefs, thousands of fish that'll all turn just at the exact same time. Entrainment. Uh, and you've noticed if you're uh, working around somebody who's argumentative or combative, uh, I'm sure none of you in New York ever experienced that, but <laughs> it's said there are people like that. Uh, and that you feel drained. By the same token, if you're with somebody that's very warm, giving, you feel energized. So uh, all those are examples of entrainment. Now, Altshuler described back in the 1940s the ISO principle where he was interested in matching a person's mood or a person's physiological state with music and gradually finding music the, first, the person found pleasing. And it would evolve over time as the person let go of various uh, anguishes and traumas. So I just want to end by reviewing some of the things that I'm uh, teaching patients. Uh, once uh, they start with sound healing techniques. Now, one is that the definition of success, many people have different definitions of success. Some people define it on their job and how many promotions they've had. Some will define it on their bank account. Uh, but really, the only definition of success is that each day you're more peaceful than you were the day before. Because no matter how much somebody's having, that isn't going to necessarily bring them peace. In fact, a lot of times it just uh, bringing them worry about losing it or keeping it. Uh, so that's very, very important, especially when you're dealing with cancer. The other is that the subtle harmony overcomes all disharmony. So what I mean by that is once you start doing sound healing techniques, you become aware that you have immense power to move toward your heart center. And then the very same problems that you were looking at previously with just your intellect that were causing you so much angst, gradually they bother you less and less until there's just this equanimity and contentment uh, in your life. So that's an example of this subtle harmony. Uh, not anything uh, that you can know 
other than by experience. And then understanding with the heart is wisdom. So all of us, we get knowledge when we go to school. If we get all A's, we're said to have a lot of knowledge. But that's very different than wisdom. Wisdom is an inner knowing. Wisdom is about understanding the truth about who you are and why you're here. So I mean by that, who are you on a soul level? What's the purpose of the human birth? And then seeing with the heart is in fact bliss. Because it's not that every, all your problems are ever going to disappear. As long as you're alive, there's going to be some new problem coming up. But when you can understand it with your heart, it's very, very different than having all the resistance and judgments. And then being the heart is truth. So once you're able to understand that kind of truth, then you could uh, have more peace every day than you had the day before. And finally, you're not that which you were. So a lot of people come in and they have a lot of guilt about something they've done, something they've said. And very important to understand, there's no need just to keep looking back other than to understand it and be able to move on. And also, you're not that which you imagined yourself to be. It's very important just to be able to go into meditative states and see, you know, what is actually there. And you are that which you are becoming. So what that means is, is all of us are evolving. And rather than being stuck in the past and stuck with ideas and stuck with expectations, if you could understand that the more you're doing these types of sound healing practices, that there's an amazing acceleration in a person's evolution and their sense of who they are. So I want to just take you very briefly uh, through some meditations similar to what I do uh, with patients. Actually, exactly uh, one of the ones I do with patients. So I'm going to take this bowl. So this is more an experiential uh, type of thing, not the kind of thing you could ever explain. That's good. I want you to start by taking deep breaths in and out through your nose, your belly soft. to have your belly so relaxed that when you breathe in, your belly expands. And when you breathe out, your belly gently falls.
It's so, one example of sound healing. And uh, do we have time for questions or later? No, we don't. Okay. We have, we're supposed, we have like a five minute break okay. for the next one. But if you Thank have you. questions and you don't want to go out and get water or whatever, please ask. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you.